Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence special webinar. As a reminder, due to the high number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute during the presentations. If you have questions, please submit them to the moderator in the Q&A box located on your control screen. Here is today's agenda and featured guest. Dr. Richard Bailey is the president of Northern New Mexico College, a four-year public institution with two campuses in New Mexico. He started as president in October 2016 after a 24-year career in the United States Air Force. Northern New Mexico College is the proud recipient of the 2019 Organization of the Year Award from the Greater Espanola Valley Chamber of Commerce and the 2019 New Mexico STEMI Award winner as the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Higher Education Institution of the Year and the 2020 Adobe Award from Quality New Mexico for its work in implementing the Baldrige Criteria for Strategic Planning and Development. Now it is a privilege to turn the presentation over to our guest panelist, Dr. Bailey. Thanks very much, Al. And uh, it's, a, it's really a privilege and a pleasure to be with all of you. I'd like to say a special thank you to the Baldridge Foundation and to the Institute for Performance Excellence for the gracious invitation. It's, it's really, really wonderful to be here with you all today to talk about Northern New Mexico College and what we did in terms of our strategic direction and our Baldridge approach. Here's a quick overview of some things that we'll be talking about. I'm gonna start with something that's almost impossible and that is defining strategy. And I use it through, through two lenses, context and adaptation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll talk about how we put that definition to use at Northern New Mexico College. Then I'm gonna take a slight right turn and offer you what maybe might seem radical, but a theory that I have about the importance of the Baldridge criteria. And I would love for you as the audience to either debate me or question it, or uh, I think it'll be a really, really healthy point, uh, launching point for conversation. And then I'll finish with an example of how we translated that strategy into practice. How did we take that vision and, and operationalize it in ways that our students, faculty and staff could, could move on? So let me start with this. Uh, I had the privilege, as, as Al said, I had the privilege of serving for 24 years in the United States Air Force. And my, my final assignment was at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. That's in Montgomery, Alabama at Maxwell Air Force Base. And it is a school that is generally regarded as the premier school of strategy, not only in the United States Air Force, but actually in the Department of Defense. And it's something that we hold dear. But I will tell you that if you walk the halls of SAS, that's what we, the, the, the school's name, if you walk the halls and you talk to the professors in those hallways and you ask them to define strategy for you, you will hear remarkably different definitions from everybody, from everybody on that faculty. And that would sound kind of crazy. Why is this school so renowned as this pinnacle of strategic education? Why would the professors not even agree on a definition of strategy? Actually, that's the selling point for the institution. Not only do all of the professors have a slightly different take on it, but we actually encourage students at that school to come up with their own working definition of strategy as a part of their educational journey. So let me qualify all of this is said. Uh, here's a book that my colleagues and I uh, published in, I think it was 2015, 2016. Obviously you can see I had some influence because context and adaptation, I think, are, are really the two critical elements. So uh, I'm going to offer you what I think is the best definition of strategy, but I will tell you that my colleagues in, in SAS will completely disagree with me. So qualifying, this is only my definition. Um, and I know this is, this is a, a mouthful, so I apologize. Just bear with me. I define strategy as a continual artistic endeavor to optimize competitive advantage through an understanding of one's environment and an adaptation to uncertainty. I know that's a lot to take in, so I'll give you a second. But if you, if you had to take two things away from this definition, here's what I think are important. I think ultimately it comes down to two things, two lenses. How do we understand our environment and how do we adapt to uncertainty? And obviously we're gonna talk a little bit more about this as we, as we talk about the case study of Northern New Mexico College. 
those two things, by the way, are very challenging endeavors, right? Both of those things, understanding our environment and adapting to uncertainty. When I arrived at Northern New Mexico College in 2016, we started an experiment really uh, to, to redefine our strategic direction. And we invited our faculty, staff, community partners, everyone to come to our auditorium to participate in a series of, of workshops. And we had two main big focus areas. One was to, to identify our current environment. And a lot of you, th this is a world you already live in. So I know I'm, I'm not telling you anything new, uh, whether it's uh, SWOT analysis, or however you want to define it. What we did is really simplify it. We just said, What's the current environment? What, how do you define our college right now? What are the things we do well? What are the things we don't do well? What are the challenges we face? What are the resource challenges? All of those things to identify that current environment. Then once we had a pretty good picture of that, we put all of that aside and we said, okay, now let's think about the desired environment and project yourself out five years from now. This is also gonna sound very controversial, but I also said, let's not put resources into that picture. In other words, forget about how resource constrained we are and every higher ed institution is, is resource constrained in some way. Let's put that aside and just dream about what you want this college to be in five years. And that really let people take the gloves off and really kind of imagine what this college could be. And so then we started to crystallize that. We put these two pictures side by side and we started to see patterns where, okay, here's where we are now, here's where we wanna be. This is all, these two things are related. And then we started to group when those things started to fit a pattern and they really did organically. So all of that effort, all of that work really led us to, two, uh, to identify four lines of effort. They, they, like I said, they fell organically into these big four categories. Enrollment, student success, communication, and team spirit. And those became the benchmark, the, the, the foundational elements of our strategic direction. Now, I'm not going to go through our whole strategic plan. I know we have, we're limited on time, so I'm just going to share with you one of them, uh, one line of effort, and that was our first one of enrollment. What we did is we had defined a goal. We articulated a 2022 vision. Again, this was fall of 2016, spring of 2017 to give ourselves a, a, a North Star to shoot for. And then for each line of effort, there were reflections. There were themes that seemed to, to come out from, from the different objectives and from the differences between where we were and where we wanted to be. That also led us, as we started to, to become more granular, to define objectives in each line of effort. So I'm skipping ahead. Uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, and we're kind of at that midway point in this strategic direction. I wanted to see how we were doing. And, and granted, this is not as granular as it should have been. So I, I completely confess that up front. I wanted to use a very, very, very simple measurement to start the conversation. And I just used red, yellow, green. Uh, green meaning that we had really made a lot of movement in the last two and a half years. Yellow, we were somewhere in between. Red, we just hadn't really moved at all. And here is how I rated us on these objectives. This is just for this first line of effort. Then I asked our students, faculty, and staff to rate us as well, because I wanted to see the differences. And it was pretty striking. Now, granted, anytime you're, you're surveying a large group of people in the aggregate, on the average, everything's going to start to, to look yellow. And I understand that. But it was still eye-opening to me, because here is how everyone else rated us right, how we rated ourselves. And so as the president of the institution, there were a couple of things. First of all, I wanted to look at obviously at where the differences were, right? In, in the, the first one and the fourth one, obviously there's something different between what I think, where I think we're at and where the rest of the team thinks we're at. And it's interesting because it, 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 there are possibilities that one of two things is happening. One is that uh, I'm just, my head's in the clouds and I'm, uh, and I'm a, uh, a point Santa, and I'm basically going to give us the benefit of the doubt. Um, and that's possible, right? That I have blind spots and I'm not seeing the, the challenges in some of these ways. The other is that there's a communication gap, right? Um, let me give you an example. In item number four, um, establish and maintain affordable tuition and fees. Um, I think we're in the green because we're the one 
college in New Mexico that has not raised tuition and fees in four years. <laughs> so we have done so well in keeping tuition and fees low, but I also need, as the president, I need to be sensitive to the fact that we may have students, faculty, and staff who say that even though, in my opinion, we're incredibly affordable, um, for, for some, it, it, it may still be too high. And really what this yellow from them might indicate is that there, in some ways we need to lower tuition and fees, right? So I need to be respectful of that difference. Um, on the first one, partnerships with local high schools, we've done, as you're gonna see here in a few more slides, we've done amazing work in partnering with local high schools, but does everyone at the college know that, right? If they don't, then I have to take uh, responsibility for that. It means I'm not communicating some of those successes as much as I should. So this was really very, very helpful. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and I want to offer you what what might seem radical, and maybe it's going to seem uh, common, but this is a theory I have about the importance of the Baldrige criteria. I And I'll just give you the bottom line up front. I think that when there is a clearly defined strategic direction, when an institution of any kind has a clearly defined strategic foundation, then I think it has a really, really important impact on the risk tolerance of that organization. And obviously risk for me, this is me personally as a leader, I think risk tolerance is incredibly important for organizations because I think that's what leads to innovation. It leads to new ideas. It leads to, to taking calculated risks. Now, I also wanna be very clear, there's a difference between risk tolerance and recklessness, right? So we need to make sure that, that institutions are willing to be bold, um, but not reckless with the decisions they make. They have to be calculated risks. Conversely, I think in the absence of clearly articulated strategic guidance, I think that individuals in those organizations will tend to be far more risk averse. And then they stay entrenched in some of the old ways of doing things. And that can be problematic for organizations. So, so my kudos to the Baldrige Foundation, the Institute for Performance Excellence is that the Baldrige criteria offers a framework that allows a strategic foundation to be clearly articulated. And that in turn then leads individuals at all levels of the organization to be a little more innovative, a little more risk tolerant, and to make decisions that will actually move the institution forward. By the way, um, it, maybe this sounds controversial. I would love to get, uh, as an audience, I would love to get your take on this theory of mine. Okay, so let's talk about what we did at Northern. This is just an example. When I arrived at the college in the fall of 2016, uh, and by the way, I retired from the Air Force on a Friday afternoon in Montgomery, Alabama. I got in my car on Saturday morning, drove to New Mexico and started on a Monday. Uh, but the time, really for the first couple of years and even before I got to New Mexico, there were two wicked problems that had plagued the college for more than a decade. They are also the two most common questions I received as a new president, really for the first couple of years of my tenure. And that was, Rick, what are you doing to restore the trades, career technical education programs, which had evaporated from the college uh, about a decade before? And what are you doing to revitalize the El Rito campus? As Al said in the beginning, there are two campuses in Northern New Mexico uh, that belong to the college. One is in Española, which is about 30 minutes north of, of Santa Fe. Uh, but our original campus, the original home of the campus from 1909 is in a little village called El Rito, which is about an hour north of Santa Fe. And again, for about a decade, especially as the trade started to evaporate, that campus really started to turn itself into a ghost town. And so uh, there's so much emotional connection to that place. And there are so many graduates from that place that inhabit Northern New Mexico that this was a challenge that they gave to me. Uh, bring back the trades and revitalize this campus. So there are two things that we, uh, two focus areas that we decided, that we started right, right from the very beginning in 2016. Because when I asked, why did the why did the El Rito campus uh, close, and why were the trade why did the trades leave? I really got the two same two similar answers. One was that utilities were too expensive up in El Rito, um, and second was that El Rito, because of its location, was very was very difficult to get to. So 
the, the strategy that we employed was twofold. One, let's not accept utilities the way they are. Let's challenge those assumptions. And second, let's make the location of the campus not just not a disadvantage, let's flip it and make it the selling point for the institution. That led us to a partnership with a group called Kit Carson Electric Cooperative. They're based in Taos. They were looking at, at positioning these massive solar arrays in their service area. It turns out that El Rito was right at the edge of their service area. So we advocated for that. And luckily, we're one of the sites chosen. So now there is a 1.5 megawatt solar array on that campus. Construction started in the spring of 2019. It went operational on December 22nd of 2019 and since that day since they flipped the switch on it that one solar array covers about 10 acres of of our northern campus has powered not just the campus but all of the customers tied into the grid in kit carson's operational area west of the rio grande all of their daytime energy needs are being met by this one solar array so not only is the college seeing reduced electricity rates, but everyone in the area is seeing reduced electricity rates. That doesn't hurt our reputation, by the way, uh, with the local community. The other thing we did on the trades issue is in trying to determine how we were gonna bring the trades back, we didn't have anyone on staff or faculty who were plum plumbing experts or electrician experts. So we went to the local unions, uh, the statewide unions and said, hey, would you like to partner with us? They agreed to that. And the ECMC Foundation out of Los Angeles was so intrigued by a, a college and unions coming together in a way to share curriculum that they gave us $750,000 to pilot the project. And that started to get us national attention. Uh, so those two things, I think, were two catalysts for what I'm about to explain. By the way, the picture on the bottom right, when the, uh, when the Biden campaign uh, reached out to our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, and asked her if she would speak at as part of the convention and asked her to speak about energy. She turned to me and asked if it would be okay for her, for her to speak outside of our newly constructed El Rito campus solar array. So not only did we, did we have this catalyst, but now we have the leader of our state in a globally televised live primetime event uh, from our little campus up in Northern New Mexico. So uh, again, uh, street credit uh, benefits to all of that. So we're really grateful to her for that. Okay, so all of those two things were catalysts for, for what was to come. And this is about us being bold and starting to, to be innovative in, in some of the solutions that we were creating. In order to bring back the trades, what we decided is to, to really do it and to and to do it without asking the state taxpayers to, do, to, to pay for it, we wanted to, there to be a local initiative. So we crafted a Senate bill in 2019 to create something called a co-located branch community college. We didn't need to create another campus because we already had that. We didn't need another president. We didn't need any of that architecture. We just wanted the ability to ask our local voters if it was worth their investment. So we crafted this Senate bill uh, by the way, this co-located branch community college, it had never been done in New Mexico. So it was the first of its kind in the history of our state. That passed, that Senate bill passed in 2019 unanimously. Republicans, Democrats, House and the Senate, everyone approved this, which, which uh, for a lot of you know, probably in your states as well, is a pretty rare thing. So we were really honored that our legislature uh, agreed with our vision. We then went to five local public school districts, Española, Pohuaque, Mesa Vista, Chama, and Hemis Mountain. I'm gonna show you those districts on a map. And I made presentations to each of those school boards and asked them, when, when public education loses funding and they've all lost funding, unfortunately, the first two things that, that tend to get cut from those budgets are the arts and the trades, right? Shop classes, all the things that we were used to Maybe uh, for those who are, who are seasoned uh, and older like me, um, those are the things that, that oftentimes, because they're expensive, oftentimes get cut from budgets. So my pitch to the school districts was, what if this co-located branch community college does the trades? And we invite your students, your high school students, to do something called dual credit, where they get credit for their high school class and credit for college at the same time. And that way the burden is not now with the local school districts, we'll take the burden as the community college. 
all five of those districts agreed and those boards agreed to come together to create our branch community college district. Again, I'm going to show you that on a map in a second. I told you before we partnered with the local unions, both uh, for plumbing and pipe fitting and for electricians. And this was important because we, we chose those uh, first two because the jobs in northern New Mexico were here. And when there are contractors who have to hire that talent from outside the state, then I'm failing as a college president because we should be growing that talent right here in our community. All of this led to a mill levy ballot question in November 2019 that took parts of three counties. And we asked local voters if this was worth their investment. And the mill levy is a small property tax. And that ballot initiative passed with over 62% of the vote. So even in a very socioeconomic, uh, so socioeconomically challenged area of our state, over 62% of the voters said, Rick, not only are the trades important, but it's worth our personal investment for you to do this. And we took that as a, as a, as a real a shot in the arm. We were really, really grateful to the community for reaching out to us that way. Okay, so this map of New Mexico shows all of the public school districts in the state of New Mexico. Here's why this is important when we talk about solutions that may be right in front of us. I'm gonna overlay, here are the five public school districts that, that we partnered with in this branch community college district. Remember I talked to you about the location of the El Rito campus and how people had said, oh, it's because it's so far removed, um, it's really problematic and that's why the campus shut down. Well, if I overlay the location of the El Rito campus, <laughs> you can see that it is almost in the perfect geographic center of these five public school districts. And so we, we positioned that campus to be a regional hub for the trades, not only for adult learners in the area, but also for high school students that wanted a pathway to career technical education and saving the school districts from the resource constraints of doing it themselves. And that leads to a path to sustainability. When that mill levy passed, that started a $2.4 million annual revenue stream in perpetuity. So we didn't have to draw from English classes or math classes or any of the education, any of the other uh, four-year college programs that we had. We didn't have to draw from any of that to make this work because now we have an independent revenue stream that allows us to do it. The theoretical courses and the general education portion of those two fields launched in the fall of 2020. We are scheduled right now, uh, con COVID considering, but we're scheduled and we'll be ready to offer hands-on classes in both of those programs in El Rito in the fall of 2021. In fact, part of that annual revenue stream is going to pay for a transportation network so that students at those high schools, all they have to do is get to their local high school and they'll have free transportation to and from the El Rito campus. We're actually gonna use a 21st century calendar model instead of a 20th century uh, so that we, we understand the rural nature of our, of our district. As I said, we'll, we're gonna cater to both dual credit high school students and adult learners who are looking for a mid-career course, uh, course change. And ultimately, here's the kicker. When I talked about contractors who bring in that talent from outside the state and have to pay them per diem and housing and everything while they're here, rather than us growing that talent ourselves. Well, when we grow that talent ourselves, now we have individuals, by the way, who make a very, very good living in those two trades. And now that money is staying in our local area. And those people are then buying real estate, supporting local businesses, paying taxes, doing all these other things that now it's not just about them. It's not just about the students and their families, but we are now lifting up entire communities with economic development and quality of life. And that was the real mission that we had in the first place. All right, so let me offer some final thoughts. Any, for, well, I didn't even put this on the slide, but let me say this. Uh, and I think I, my colleagues at SAS would appreciate this. Anyone who says they have a blueprint uh, and I'm not talking Baldrige criteria, but I mean a blueprint for everything about strategy, uh, I think is misguided. I think strategy is inherently messy. And so that's where context and adaptation really play an important role. And maybe we can talk more about that in Q&A. The strategic direction that we created has, has been a, an important guide for all of our resource decisions. 
um, and, and on both sides, right? When we have when we have precious new resources that come into the institution, we make sure it's tied to the strategic direction because we've already decided that's what's important. Conversely, when there are when there is funding that we are contributing to things that really aren't that important in our strategic direction, then we should question those and, and look at whether or not our resources are being spent in the most efficient way. Uh, as I said before, I think it allows for greater risk tolerance and innovative so solutions because we have that strategic foundation. I think the Baldrige criteria provided that structure that we needed to become more effective and efficient, and the, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, I, I brag about the college for a living. So yeah, I, you know, you have to accept that right off the front, but it is so easy to brag about this amazing group because we really have achieved some amazing successes these last five years. And that is a testament to the resilience of our students and the, and the magic that our faculty and staff bring to everything they do every day. And the process continues. Uh, I know you're the experts on this, the strategic direction is not something that's set in stone. It's a living document. It needs to evolve over time. And as we continue to adapt to uncertainty, it starts to evolve. So, uh, so the process continues. Again, I want to say a very special thank you to the Baldridge Foundation and to the Institute of Performance Excellence. It is truly an honor to be here with you all. And with that, I will turn it back over to Al and to the rest of the group for questions and answers. Well, thank you for such an outstanding presentation, Rick. The uh, questions are coming in pretty rapid here. <laughs> and I'm gonna throw the first one at you. You mentioned adaptation to uncertainty as a key element of strategy. Let's, could you please unpack that a bit? What are the sources of uncertainty and how do we as leaders adapt to it to optimize our decision-making? So, that, so that's a great question, Al. So. Um, and I have a, a, a pretty complex answer to it. So uncertainty comes in, I think, in two big ways. First, I talked about the importance of trying to understand our environment. And our own understanding of our environment is inherently flawed. So I think right off the top, because we don't understand our own environment perfectly, I think that is a built-in source of uncertainty. The second one, and it's, and it's related, is that we live in a complex and highly dynamic environment. So even if, and by the way, it's never going to happen, but even if we had a perfect understanding of our environment, five minutes from now, it's going to be different, right? Because we're constantly, our environment is constantly moving. So I think those are the two big sources of uncertainty. And it really makes strategy somewhat of it. That's why it's an art because there's some prognostication involved, right? It, for our team to look at the college five years from now and say, what, what do we want that to look like? There's some imagination, but there's also um, the, the pathway to get there is not set. So obviously there are going to be things that, that come into the, that, that path, either as vehicles to help us or as obstacles in the path that we're going to have to, to, to be ready for. So I think those are the big sources of uncertainty. Thank you. Our second question is, what is the relationship between information and uncertainty for leaders? Yeah, I, I, I hope, I hope, well, I, I'll leave his name out of it. Um, I had an epiphany uh, a while ago, and I, I'm pretty sure Al would, would appreciate this story. Um, I was sitting in Afghanistan one night and it was probably two or three in the morning, and it was me and a general officer who will remain nameless. And we were looking at real-time intelligence. I don't want to get too much into the weeds on what that is, but let's just say we were inundated with real-time information that was coming in about battlefields all over, the, all over the region. And he turned to me and said something truly profound. He said, um, since, since the dawn of time, anytime there's been conflict, leaders have been trying to get access to more and more information to help make better decisions. For those of you who have read Sun Tzu, this is the Sun Tzu argument, right? Uh, know yourself, know your enemy. Uh, all of that's important. But what he argued was that now his challenge wasn't access to information. It was in access to the information that would help him make decisions and separate it from the noise. I think there is a paradigm shift 
that has happened in the relationship between information and strategic decision making. Oh, this is also going to sound probably heretical to some of the audience. Um, it was in one of the it was in one of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, I think it was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who, who said this, that the best place to hide a needle isn't in a haystack. The best place to hide a needle is in a huge stack of needles. I think that is the challenge today for strategic decision makers. And that is, it's not that we don't have access to information. It's that we have access to so much information that leaders need to determine from this stack of needles, which is the needle that I need to make a really good decision. Um, and I can't say a perfect decision or an optimal decision because it's messy, right? Uh, so uh, I think that is the real challenge now for leaders is in determining not only how we receive information, but how do you prioritize the information that we receive to help you make uh, the, the, the best educated decisions you can make. Thank you, Rick. Our next question is, if you could go back in time when you started this strategic direction for the college, what would you have changed? It, you know, it's interesting. I, not much to answer your question, but there, there is one thing that I really, and I have to take responsibility for it. Um, we, we purposely wanted a big tent. We invited everybody into this conversation when we started, we did these big workshops in our auditorium. Um, I'll give you an example. We had a few of our custodial staff who participated. They've been at the college for 30 years. And, and if they don't know where some of the bodies are buried, I mean, they, they, it, then we would be missing out because they are, they are pearls of wisdom that they had ready to share with us. And they were incredibly productive. So I'm, I'm grateful that we did a big tent, but we did not have a robust student participation in that. And that was just my fault. Um, and I think at the time I was probably thinking, well, you know, students come to the college and they, you know, they're only here for a short time and maybe they don't fully understand the institution and how the dynamics work. And I think some of that's true. But I also think that a, 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 a stronger student voice in that strategic direction would have helped us uh, immensely. Uh, and I was too short sighted to see it at the time. So I think if I could go back, I would have invited student leaders to be a, a to have a more prominent voice in that. Now, I will say this, in the years that followed, students have become incredibly important voices in, in how we have managed that strategic direction, but I would have invited them to have a more prominent role in the beginning. Great, our next question is, did you receive any pushback from the team at the college during the process? No. No, and I got to tell you, I am uh, I am blown away by that. Now, as a as a new leader at the institution, I mean, we we started this process within weeks of my arrival. So, um, so I'm I'm sure that I was still in the honeymoon phase in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of our relationship. But uh, this is, and it's really a testament to our faculty, staff, community leaders, everyone who had a hand in it. I think everyone was generally interested, genuinely interested in this process and interest, interested in what this was going to develop. The, the fact that we made this by design a really big tent really helped because now everyone had not only a say in it, but now everyone has buy-in to the, to the direction. Uh, and, and so it's not, it's not me coming to the college with a strategic vision. It's the college's strategic vision. I think that is, that's paid dividends for us. Our next question is, what do you think the future holds for Northern New Mexico College? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I imagine that, that Northern is not unique in this, uh, in this issue um, because as we come out of this pandemic, uh, I think the the higher education landscape is going to look fundamentally different. Now, I don't not necessarily mean that we're going to push everything online, but I'll give you an example. We did a survey of our students uh, a few months ago, and we asked them, "What what does this look like for you when you come back? What do you want the college to look like when we come back?" Just in terms of the modes of delivery for classes, uh, 
we had about a third of our students respond to the survey, which is pretty big. And 67% of them said they wanted more, if not all of their classes to be online. And by the way, many of those students who responded that way were the students who were kicking and screaming in March 2020 when we had to move everything online. By the way, uh, sidebar, this was not easy in rural northern New Mexico. In, in Rio Riva County, where our two campuses sit, 48% of homes don't have access to internet. So moving everything online was not a panacea for us. And we've really had to be creative in, in terms of helping students. And our philanthropy has adjusted uh, to do that as well. So I think, I think the big challenge of the future for Northern is to be uh, continue to be adaptive to what will be a very, very dramatic change in the higher education landscape. We talked about uncertainty and, and adapting to uncertainty. What I think for the future of Northern is that the time horizons in which we make those strategic decisions will be smaller. So I think the challenges is, are going to be for us to be even more nimble in how we adapt to that changing environment. I have a couple more questions coming in from the field here. One of them is, um, when you started this process, did you follow the Baldridge criteria uh, as it was written? Did you deviate a little bit? Did you have to do any special adaptations for your situation? Yeah, great question. Um, no, so, I, and let me, I wanna be very clear. I am not a Baldridge expert um, and, and I wouldn't profess to be. Um, I really started with the, the work that I had done at SAS and, and really took that for a walk and, and realized that in, in doing that process, we really almost organically were following the Baldridge criteria. In fact, when we won the award from Quality New Mexico, the Adobe Award, and, and by the way, that's kind of our introduction into, into Quality New Mexico. We still have several, uh, several levels to, to achieve. Um, it, it, it almost fit perfectly within that criteria. I think the part that we um, where we have not adapted Baldridge um, yet and really need to, to do more is in some of the granularity, right? When you look at, I, I showed you in the presentation, the red, yellow, green, um, that is so rudimentary in terms of what, what, what I would interpret the Baldridge criteria to really do because you're really drilling down into um, performance measures and metrics and milestones and all those other things that, that I think uh, would really benefit to provide some granularity in some of that operationalization we talked about. Thank you. Our next question is, how did you get the different divisions within the college to come together to achieve the mission and the vision in your pursuit using the Baldwin framework? Wow, great question. Um, there, so there's a simple answer and, and probably a more complex answer. Uh, the simple answer is, um, Northern New Mexico College is a special place. And by the way, you know, again, I'm so biased. So I, I, have, to, I have to confess that up front. Um, but I do think there is a, I think there is a deep respect for each other as colleagues. It doesn't matter what, what you do at the college. I think there is a, a deep respect. It doesn't mean we always agree. And it doesn't mean we're, you know, we're not a dysfunctional family once in a while, but I do think that there is a, a genuine love and appreciation. The other thing I'll say is this, it doesn't matter what people do at the college, faculty members, staff members, custodial staff, kitchen staff, uh, um, administrators, board members, the one thing every single person has in common, and I can say this without hesitation, the one thing everyone has in common is a deep love for our students. And so when, when you start with that and, and that becomes the bedrock of what it is that you're trying to do, then I think all the silos and all the, the artificial structures that are, that are inherent in, in any complex organization start to dissipate some. Uh, and then you can find some, some common ground. So um, immediately this started as, hey, how are we going to serve students better five years from now? And everyone had a had a voice in that and everyone had ideas about that. So I think that was, I think that was the big, uh, the big kicker. Now, um, the, the reason it's complex is, are, are, you know, did we find the magic bullet and, you know, are those silos now broken? No, I, they, they exist. And, and if you're not careful, they continue to, to, to build up. So I think as an institution, we constantly have to find ways to, to create 
even even um, I don't want to say force, but but to really strongly encourage activities that that bring different elements of the college together at the same time. I, when you in, in several slides ago, you saw one of the four big pillars of our strategic direction is team spirit. And that really is based on um, that concept. You know, how do we how do we make sure that every single person at this college, no matter what what they do, how do we make sure that everyone knows that they are valued and not just feel like they're valued, but know that they're valued. Uh, and that's a that's a that's a work that that's ongoing and needs to be ongoing. Thank you. Next question is, what do you feel that the immediate return on investment was that encouraged you to keep going with the Baldrige process when you began to implement it? Great question. I think it comes down to, um, to two, oh gosh, I, the more I think about it, the more answers I'm going to have. Uh, let me start with the, the big one. I think the biggest return on investment is the is the moving the needle in terms of risk aversion, risk risk tolerance. Um, I think that is the biggest, again, just my theory. I think that is the biggest, most important aspect of the criteria that it that by providing that framework, individuals within the organization can be more risk tolerant. Now, let me let me give it a slight aside to this. Um, as leaders in organizations, we can influence that, right? Uh, I've said a few times at convocations or state of the college addresses or um, different events where we, we have all of our faculty and staff together that, hey, we need to be more risk tolerant. I've even said publicly that if, and I, you know, talking to our team, if you come up with an idea and, and it's not just reckless, but you've actually did some, you know, put some serious thought into this and you're operating with your mind and your heart in the right place and it's a risk and we take it. Um, if it fails, then as the chief executive officer, I'll take responsibility for it. I'll be the one to, to go to the board and, and I'll accept the, the, the failure. But if it works, then you're the person uh, you'll be the the statue that we build in front of the, the the campus. You'll be the the one people are singing songs about. The the, the idea is to try and shift the risk the risk to more toward the, the the chief executive and really to encourage us to do that. The the other piece of this this is a long answer to your question. I apologize. The other piece of this is to is to make sure that decisions are are supported at all levels of the organization. Right part part of risk tolerance is allowing everyone to be an innovator, everyone. Um, and the more we do that, the more we, we cultivate that in environment, uh, the better. The second part of the, and I'll just give this quick, the second part of that uh, question, well, my second answer to that question has to do again with, with resource decisions. Northern New Mexico is, uh, and Northern New Mexico College is not sitting on a billion dollar endowment. We're just not. And and so we are, because our tuition is so low, which I love, um, we are very dependent on, uh, on other sources of revenue. We're highly dependent on grant funding. We're highly dependent on state, um, state appropriations and all these other things. Um, and so we, we operate in a very, very resource constrained environment. I think the Baldrige criteria, I think really uh, any effort to, to create a very solid strategic direction allows leaders at all levels of the organization to make better informed decisions when it comes to where to place precious resources. We've got one last question here, and I think this somewhat um, ties together your entire presentation here today, Rick, and that is, what advice would you give to community college leaders like yourself around the country who are considering using the Baldridge framework? Yeah, I, well, I, obviously I'm biased, but I'm going to say it's, it's a, it's a huge, um, it can be a huge benefit. Um, I would say uh, the, a wise person once told me, I hope I get this right. Um, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that is counted counts. Um, so that's my that's my little that's my little teaser to 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 tweak the answer a little bit to say the the Baldrige criteria for any 
leader, uh, two year, four year, it doesn't matter. And really higher ed, other organizations, I think all, all can be very similar. I think the Baldridge criteria can be, inc- obviously for us, it can be incredibly helpful an incredibly powerful tool, not only just in terms of the mechanics of the organization, but really in terms of the culture that you're trying to inspire at the organization. So I I am a huge fan of it, but I also think it should be done in a way so that it's not a self-licking ice cream cone. And and what I mean by that is um, let let the Baldrige criteria be a tool for the thinking and the innovation and all the other things that you're trying to do for your institution. Again, whether this is a community college or, or any other organization, I think the key is using it to the extent that it allows everyone in the organization to be innovative and to be creative with ideas and to make um, the, the best informed and best educated decisions that they can at all levels of the organization. That's, that's the magic of the, of the Baltridge criteria. Thanks again, Rick. Your presentation today was certainly engaging and just just so interesting. And we truly appreciate you taking the time to spend with us today to share your story and help us as we try to promote Baldrige in the community college space around the country. Uh, yeah, it's been I'd a like pleasure. Remind, I'd like to remind everybody that the Baldrige Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence has a great deal of online training that is available and we encourage you to take a look at it to include the three new leadership courses that we will be unveiling in the month of June. And lastly, I would like to thank once again, all of our sponsors out there, especially the Mac Baldridge Society's Institute trustees, the Baldridge family, Adventist Health, Stellar Solutions, and Midway USA. Through their generous support, we have been able to make resources through the Institute like this webinar here today available to you around the country. Thank you very much for your time today. Take care.